I was at a, a guided meditation exercise a while back, and we were asked to think back to the saddest moment in our lives. It was a very interesting exercise. And there's a room of us, and we were literally guided to go back to the saddest moment and think of the colors and the textures and who was with us and what we were wearing and really go back in our minds to that time. And you saw everyone's posture change, you know? They, they all just started slouching, they started tearing. Some of them started crying, just bringing those memories back. And then we were asked to think of the happiest time in our lives. And, and that could be the moment you fell in love, the moment you got married, the moment you got divorced, wh whatever the happiest moment was. And everyone's posture changed again. And they're all lit up and they started giggling to themselves or whatnot. And the power behind that exercise for me was the fact that we controlled how we felt. We were in complete control of it. And yet how often do we say, I can't help the way I feel. Or worse yet, you make me feel dot, dot, dot. Right? And yet, it, it was um, Eleanor Roosevelt who said, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. And I believe no one can make you feel anything without your consent. And so the responsibility was put back on us that our feelings are choices. Now, an interesting thing I learned was uh, the difference between a feeling and an emotion. The, the feelings that we have uh, are all over the place. You know, we're driving home, we're stuck in traffic, we're really frustrated, somebody cuts us off and we get really angry, but then our favorite song comes on the radio and we get really happy. And then we show up at home and we're very relieved. And then we find out the dog pooped on the floor, so we get really upset again. But then our spouse shows up with dinner and we're very happy, but then it doesn't have what we really wanted. And so we're, so, and it's just all over, the, and that's fine. Those feelings are perfectly normal. There's nothing wrong with feeling all of them. A feeling lasts about 45 seconds to a minute and a half, and then it's gone, and it makes way for a new feeling, and it's just like this revolving door, and it's totally fine. An emotion, an emotion can last a lifetime, can last 30, 40 years. It's, it's a feeling that we had, anger, resentment, upset, and it came and went, but we built a story around it. And that emotion can last for years, as long as we keep feeding that story. That's how people stay angry at somebody for 30, 40 years without letting it go. Whatever it was that initially set them off is long gone. That person is, you know, and yet that feeling is there just as real as it was that moment. And taking responsibility for it all and realizing that it's a choice, that, the, that we choose to be angry is to me the most liberating thing because we're not doing this anymore, we're doing this. We're looking within. And when you get upset, when you get happy, you're like, how, you realize I'm doing this. And that's really great because you're the only one who can undo it. If there's a story around an emotion, that means at one point in your life you wrote a story about what happened. And it could be, you know, you were abused as a child and you can spend your entire life as a victim of child abuse because you wrote a story around it that victimized you. Or you can be empowered by it because it made you who you are today. You could be a spokesperson against child abuse because of it, and it's coming from an empowered place rather than a victim place. And we're the ones who put those labels on there. And labels are so detrimental to our growth. We, even within our language, when we're upset, we say, I am angry. That is so dangerous. A more honest response would say, I'm feeling anger right now. Because when you say, I am angry, you are defining yourself, you are identifying yourself by a temporary feeling. And that's very dangerous, because once you admit it, once you say, this is who I am, I am angry, you approach the world from that place of anger. It shifts everything. But it's built into our language, and that's a very dangerous place to be. So... There, there is a lot of stuff in the book. Um, feelings versus emotions is just one chapter. Um, all the chapters are about a page long. As I said, they were originally all just emails that were sent out to friends. I never intended for them to be published. But 
and, and we can talk about so many different things, and I would actually love for it to be more of a discussion than a talk. And normally there's, you know, a couple hours to do this, but I've been told it's that we're actually very limited on time because the doors literally close um, at a certain hour, and we can't stay here past that. But I would love to hear from anyone who already has read the book if something that resonated with them um, or questions that you have. I often open the floor for questions and no one has any. But then when they come up to have their book signed, everyone has one. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's very interesting to, to be in this place where my personal life is so public. But it's also very... The invitation is for all of us to do that because we quite often hold so much of the stuff that we really want to talk about on the inside. And I get so many emails from people who say, oh, you're so courageous and brave for being so honest. And I don't understand why honesty is an act of bravery. You know, it, no one's going to judge you for being honest. In fact, the moment I open up and talk about what I'm going through, other people can relate to me more. They don't judge me, they're closer to me. And so my invitation isn't to be, oh, this is so great, here's this guy who's being honest. It's be that. Does that, does that make sense? It's, it's to invite people into your life and really open up. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing, to me, the, the only scary thing is keeping it hidden. You know, social media has made it so possible for us to say something, anything, and thousands of people see it. But we don't share our true selves. We share the photoshopped edition of our lives, don't we? You know, we, we only share the highlights, the good stuff. And I, I saw a post online the other day that perfectly encapsulated this. It was rude, but it was funny. It said, may your life one day be as wonderful as you pretend it is on Facebook. And wouldn't that be great? You know, it's... I invite you to be raw, to be honest, to promote what you love instead of bashing what you hate. It's, it's Even if you're really passionate about a cause, talk about the wonderful aspects of it rather than bashing the ones who are against it. It's, it's Mother Teresa saying, if you invite me to an anti-war rally, I won't go. But if you invite me to a pro-peace rally, I will be there. And it's living in the positive. It's, it's approaching everything from a, a really great place and not letting outside stuff affect you internally so much. And I don't know, maybe you can help me with this, Eitan, but it's very interesting how we let outside stuff affect us internally so much. You know, we, somebody's frustrating at work and we get frustrated. Someone's annoying and we get annoyed. In Israel, it's very interesting. When somebody bombs a bus, we just catch the next one. And I know it sounds really insensitive, but it's a huge culture surrounded by terrorism, but we refuse to be terrorized. It's, it's a very different thing. It's Again, it's writing a story around it that this does not define us. That's not who we are. We will go on. And it, will, and it, it doesn't mean that we're not affected by it. It doesn't mean that we're not saddened by it. But it doesn't define us. Do, does that make any... Okay, good. Because it makes sense in here, but that doesn't always come out well. And it's, again, it's in our language. You know, are any of you familiar with the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi? Some are saying it. I've been sitting with that prayer since 1993. It's my morning mantra, if you would. But I had a little issue with a certain part of it. It, um, it starts off saying, make me an instrument of that peace. Not a really hard time with that. Saying make me means that, it implies that I'm not already. And so I started my every morning from a place of lack. From, you know, at, please make me something I'm not. It's like, that didn't feel good to me. It was just like, and so I just swapped it. And I said, I am an instrument of peace. I owned, I said, this is my intention. And that, that was very different than to starting from a place of lack, but starting from a place of empowerment and ability. And it's just been a fantastic journey of looking within, looking at the language we use, not just in speaking to others, but to ourselves, more importantly. We are our greatest critic, right? <laughs> or worst critic. And 
it's really important that we bring a certain level of mindfulness and awareness to what a huge impact those words have on us. Have you read The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz? I figured, if not, please do. <laughs> um, they're very simple, but the first agreement is to be impeccable with your word. And it means a lot more than just being honest. It means being really conscious of how much power our words have around for, uh, for us and other people around us. Still focusing on anger. Um, it, you, you know, energy flows where attention goes, and you're putting a lot of attention on the anger. Um, it's it, it, mine is a very antidotal system, so to speak, which again brings me back to this will never happen in this state. <laughs> the prayer of Saint Francis is very antidotal and invites you to look within, and wherever there's hatred, let me sow love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there's doubt, faith. Where there's despair, hope. Where there's darkness, light. Where there's sadness, joy. And so, if you sit with that every day, you realize that. Psychologically speaking, uh, cognitively speaking, our, our mind can't rest at ease with two opposing thoughts. It, it literally can't. If you study cognitive dissonance, you're very familiar with this concept. You can't know that smoking is bad for you and yet smoke two packs of cigarettes every day without cognitively introducing a whole new thought in between that makes it okay to smoke two packs a day. Because otherwise your brain won't rest at ease. And so a new thought has to be introduced between that says it's okay to be that. Whether, oh, well, it's not cocaine. Oh, okay. Then you're, oh, then you're okay. Do you see what we do? We do this all the time. And so with anger, anger is, is it, the only person it hurts is the person being angry. And so when you, when you realize that this is affecting you, you're, you're, you're harming yourself and you want to be gentler to yourself. Um, you would you would catch yourself. My my friend has the practice of naming her demons, so to speak. And from what it sounds like, um, this is something that you said. It comes up, it, like it sneaks up on you, the anger or whatnot. So what she does is, she, if you're prone to anger, then give your anger a name. Um, call her Agnes. And so, when you're in a situation and you feel her sh bubbling up, just go, oh, there she is. She's coming up because you literally turn into someone else when you get angry. And it's not you. It's not your true self. It's not who you really want to be. It's, it's Agnes. And so you just, you honor her. You say, I see you and you're not invited. And, and it's kind of like an obnoxious little kid who's like, mom, 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 mom. All you have to do is acknowledge it and go, I see you. And for me, that that quiets it down quite a bit. But having a really clear idea of the kind of person you want to be is really important. So I invite you to go home and take out a piece of paper and a pen and write out, this is the kind of person I want to be. I want to be gentle. I want to be patient. I want to be kind and generous. Don't, it, don't focus on, oh, these are my beliefs. Okay? Your beliefs don't make you a better person. Your behavior does. So it doesn't matter if you're Christian or Buddhist or whatever label you want to put on it. That the label does not make who you are. But if you have a list of behavior you want to exhibit in the world for yourself and others, then write it out. And then ask yourself, is my behavior in the world, are the, the posts that I'm putting on Facebook, are the letters that I'm sending, is the, are the conversations like somebody else, be like that paragraph you wrote about the person you want to be. Does that make sense? And be gentle with yourself. It's, it's a habitual tendency like everything else. And so if you have the habitual tendency to, to lose patience, well, the universe is just going to invite you into more situations where you have to be patient. All of these situations are invitations. They're lessons. And a lesson will repeat itself until you learn it. So if you want patience, you'll stand in line a lot. You'll be stuck in traffic a lot. It's just the way it works. I hope that answers that.